Great. Yeah, thanks for joining everybody and, and join. Um, we're starting our technology sharing session for May. Really excited to have two great uh, presenters. Um, while we wait for some other attendees to trickle in, I'll, I'll share a few slides as an introduction. My name is Sumin Sun. I'm the program director at the Long Duration Energy Storage Council. Uh, just to give you a little um, background on how we got started and why we got started, we are seeing uh, record-breaking climate events all around the world, um, and, and we are seeing more and more communities, companies, governments setting net zero targets and, and really being aggressive about decarbonization. And, and Eldest provides that uh, a solution that's flexible, resilient, reliable, and affordable to, um, to help with the decarbonization. So Elders Council, we are a, a, a sorry, 60 member organization. Uh, we have great, um, some really interesting companies who are on the te technology provider side, really de developing and deploying uh, diverse uh, technologies uh, that are eight hours plus of duration. And then we also have men uh, anchor members who are other uh, members who are within the Eldest ecosystem. And uh, we, represent many different technologies in thermal, electrochemical, mechanical, and chemical. And today we are, our focus will be on mechanical. Um, as many of you may know, pump storage is one of the oldest, eldest technologies. It's been around for a hundred years. Um, and you, you, we find that in many countries. Um, in, in more recent years, there's been a lot more innovation and, and new forms of pumped hydro. So we'll be hearing from two companies, right, uh, Re-Energize that has a gravity-based pump storage and uh, ride development uh, that has closed loop pump Tidro and run of river. So you'll learn more about these two companies. And just before I hand it over to our speakers, I did, didn't wanna make a plug for the Eldest Council. We have four reports uh, ranging from topics on policy and 24 seven clean PPA. So I encourage you to visit our website and take a look at the reports. And we, we do also make um, a lot of announcements and share news on our uh, social media. Uh, we do also make announcements um, on future events, so please feel free to check us out on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. So I'll now hand it over to our two speakers. Uh, Tamash Bertigny is the co-founder and CTO of Re-Energize, and so we'll hear from him first. And Ushaka Ja is the VP of Project Engineering at Ride Development. Um, we'll hear from each one of them, and we'll, we'll also have a Q&A, so if you have any questions, feel free to use the the Q&A, uh, the, the feature to, to pose your questions. Thank you. I'll hand it over to Tamash first. Well, thank you very much. Okay, well, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for, for having us. I was gonna say we're uh, very excited to have this technology sharing session because we don't often or at least I should say, we haven't often yet had the chance to share a lot of the technology that we're developing here at Reenergize. That's gonna change in the coming months, but, uh, but fair enough to say that I think uh, there's gonna be a bunch of stuff I'm gonna get to show today that has never been seen by anyone outside this company. So I, I hope you enjoy that. Despite this being a technology focus, I do need to start with the big picture, the perspective, the context, because without that, the technology probably doesn't make sense. So, so what are we doing at Reenergize and why are we doing it? And I always start with this slide and there's the Elders Council front and center. You know, it's a fantastic thing to say that the long duration energy storage market is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity and taking at face value, that's super exciting already. But for us, it also speaks to the fundamental problem that needs to be solved, which is what about scale? So scale, how do you scale to address this massive, absolutely massive opportunity? And there aren't a lot of trillion dollar opportunities out there. So this is, this is a huge thing. And to put it into perspective, um, you know, just to meet 2040 targets, uh, energy transition targets. So just to meet the 2040 targets, we need to duplicate all of the energy storage ever created by humanity more than 10 times over. And we need to do it in one tenth the time it's taken us to do it thus far. So 10 times 10, it's a hundred X increase in the rate of deployment of energy storage. Now, if you study macroeconomics and, and industry, you realize that 100x change means business as usual won't cut it. So this is the problem Reenergize set about to solve. How do we provide a winning solution for long duration energy storage that will be able to scale? And we're very specific here. Scaling to us means the ability to deploy in very large volumes, very quickly and globally. 
So let's start with conventional pumped hydro storage. We love pumped hydro storage. I think that'll be obvious by the end of this presentation. Um, this is where water is pumped up a mountain and energy is stored in the form of gravitational potential energy. Um, <clears throat> it's one of the lowest cost forms of uh, uh, energy storage out there. Um, it's low risk. It's considered very proven technology um, for the global presence, which means you know, uh, supply chain, O&M, routes to market, manufacturing capacity, it's all there. So no wonder that pump storage makes up virtually all of the energy storage available today, effectively. And yet, <clears throat> when industry is talking about the, the looming energy transition crisis for the next 15 years, um, and I say crisis, it could be a gold rush depending on, depending on which side of that you are on. Uh, well, pump storage doesn't really grab the headlines. And why is that? It's because it's not scalable. So these are three recently completed pumped hydro projects. You know, the price tags are, you know, close enough to billion dollar price tag, but much more significant and problematic are the timescales are measured in decades. So, so once again, just perspective, if we need to build something like a thousand of these giga pump hydro projects in the next you know, 15 years, then considering the lean times, we should have already started developing a thousand of these projects. Spoiler alert, we, we haven't. So the question is, what is preventing pumped hydro storage from, from really being able to scale? So we can do a, you know, go look at the root cause, you know, recursively reduce problems to find what the, the root cause is. And generally it comes down to one of two major issues when we ask that question of what is preventing long duration energy storage technology from being truly scalable. One of these is a constraint in the raw material supply chain. So textbook example of this is lithium ion batteries, which are a very good energy storage technology. But, you know, the statistic I like, and the reference is there at the bottom of the slide, but I bet you no one can read it because I can't read it. But it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the reference is that um, all of the lithium production that is existing and planned through to the end of the decade won't even meet half the demand of mobility storage, so, so electric vehicles, and there's, let alone speak of long duration energy storage. So there's an example where the raw material supply chain is a fundamental constraint, the ability to scale. The other example or, or condition would be if you're a constraint in the, the, the suitable project site so that your site requirement is such that you're constrained in the number of possible sites. And this is where conventional pumped hydro struggles. Um, to put it simply, the elevation it needs is a big problem. Uh, pumped hydro needs, to, to put it colloquially, a, a mountain, uh, or at least hundreds of meters of elevation. Um, and much of a suitable but a geography like that would be in areas of natural beauty, making environmental impact assessment a problem. So to recoup investments, developers want to squeeze in as much megawatts as they can. So then the project goes up in scale and planning becomes more. So this is like a vicious circle that results in these giga projects and makes them so cumbersome. So that's the one we wanted to focus on. So going back to our picture here, our value proposition is to bring innovation to pumped hydro storage to make it very scalable while preserving that best of class economics and leveraging that existing global knowledge base we were talking about. The solution is called high density hydro. And as the name implies, it involves replacing water as the working fluid with a high density fluid. So this fluid is two and a half times as dense as water. And what this means is we can achieve the same performance, all else being equal, but with two and a half times less elevation. So Again, waving my hand a little, but but the idea of moving a hill instead of a mountain is what you need. So it sounds simple, right? Um, as I get older, I come to realize that sometimes simple ideas are the best best ideas. Um, so when all is said and done, uh, replacing water with a high density fluid in a closed loop system reduces the required vertical elevation, and this then unlocks hundreds of times more potential sites. Where's this leverage coming from? Well, I like to say that you know the gods of geography are on our side in this one. Put it again very simply, there are a lot more hills than there are mountains. So we've completed quite detailed GIS studies and the long and the short of it, it reveals that there's enough site potential around the world to meet the needs of energy transition using HD hydro several times over. So this now is a scalable solution. Some of the other things you might have noticed, so here, here we have a schematic view of, of a HD Hydro project. So some of the other things you might notice looking at this, well, so for one thing, HD Hydro's closed loop system, that high density fluid is alternating between the upper and lower reservoirs. It never leaves the system. 
Um, they are smaller. These projects are smaller than traditional, you know, the giga scale pump projects. So we estimate that the bulk of our customers will choose project size in the tens of megawatts. No visual impact. So you know we can see that the, the reservoir can be buried underground, the penstock is underground, less of an impact. We can um, start to put the projects in areas. Uh, sorry, there's a I'm getting a warning, but low. Um, yeah, where is I? So we can move to a cost reduction vector is by a learning curves. This is one of the secrets about hydro and pumped hydro storage is, you know, each project today at, historically has been a custom one-off project. Um, so moving away from that paradigm is critical economic sense, such as near large population centers with significant demand or in areas of transmission system congestions, or as shown here, co-location with renewable generation. And what you're seeing here is instead of a vicious spiral, it's a virtuous circle. Um, and ultimately, I think one of the most exciting consequences of this approach is that it makes high density hydro version of pump storage accessible to developers. Those same developers that have been so enormously successful in driving the massive adoption of wind and solar in the last two or three decades, you know, they don't, they don't get involved in normal pump storage when it takes 18 years to, to get their money. That, that, that doesn't work. Uh, but if we're, our ambition is to create a technology that can scale in the order of, you know, two years uh, deployment, well, that suddenly is very relatable in terms of what they're already doing in wind and solar. So let's move on to the technology. Um, <clears throat> our secret sauce <laughs> is literally a sauce. So here's, here's an image of our high density fluid. Um, we've designed it and engineered it to be a better working fluid. A key point we've already touched on, it's got a high specific gravity, a high density. It's two and a half times dense as water. I wish you guys were all here. It'd be a bit crowded, but uh, it'd be fun because I could actually show you that stuff. Um, so you have to take my word for it. It's low viscosity. Now here we have a little video, so hopefully you can see, I get a little feel for how this looks. It flows. Um, it has to be very low cost, and it has to be completely environmentally benign. Remember, um, the benchmark here is water. So our fluid has to be, you know, at least equally friendly to the people and environment. Um, the way we achieve this is um, by... Uh, I'm not going to tell you the secrets, but the, the big picture is we take a mineral and we suspend it in water. And so here what you're seeing is this mixing system. Here we have a loop of water circulating at first and we gradually, through our secret process, we're, we're adding the powder and you'll see the pipe in the front, very, there it goes, abruptly changing color. That's as the uh, mix is, is progressing. And this is how we're mixing and creating this fluid. Um, <clears throat> Our high density fluid we've been actually working at for a long time. Reenergize came out of a project that was quite a few years ago in the in the UK. So at benchtop and lab scale, we've been using our, our prototype fluid. And now we're we're very well advanced in developing our next generation fluid, which of course is gonna have you know focus there is really taking everything we've learned and applying it to a fluid to dramatically increase performance. So you can imagine there's a lot of science going on in this area. Um, and thus far, we've really developed our technology in the lab and in the field. So um, just to, by the way, we've got two fully granted patents, uh, I think something like six more in the pipeline coming through. Um, we've used a lot of test rigs um, to validate the HD hydro system. And we've even run a small demonstration project uh, last year on a ski hill. Our test rigs, so here's, a, you can actually probably see them over my shoulder. Um, the test rigs here in the lab, we have quite a few different ones. They serve various purposes. One simulates the HD hydro project, so pressurized test rig, we can test fluid and turbine and control system and valves. We also have different systems that simulate fluid longevity or fluid management systems. A big area we have to work in is fluid engineering, how do we produce tens of thousands of cubic meters of this fluid in a project, right? It's a big challenge. And as I said, we did a field demonstration. So this was you know, not quite a year ago. It was very small, it was a five kilowatt demonstrator, but it was very valuable for us. And we, we sort of built a small um, demonstration project. Um, this is just a clip of the video uh, showing it. Uh, it's available on our website. If anyone's curious, just go to our website. There's a, there's a longer form video of this showing the beautiful ski hill and, and the demonstration project we did. But all of this work, the test rigs and this little demonstration project, it's just the precursor to the next big step, which has already begun. So 
At the end of last year, Reenergize won the Long Duration Energy Storage Competition, which was funded by the UK government. Not only does this provide a very significant uh, validation for us as a business, it's also enabled us to begin construction of a 500 kilowatt high density hydro demonstration project. So this is happening in the UK near Plymouth. Uh, it's progressing very quickly. It's a 24 month project. We're, we're pretty much a third of the way through already. Um, we have a custom turbine. It's about to enter manufacturing. Uh, we've uh, site works and I guess I've effectively begun uh, construction. You know, shovels in the ground are, are imminent. Uh, our custom fluid management system will be tested later this year. And the overall project will be fully operational by next summer. That, that's progressing very quickly. Here are just some, some pretty pictures. This is a, a plan view showing the project. It's, it looks a lot like a conventional pumped hydro storage. Um, in this case, 500 kilowatts. The uh, vertical elevation is 82 meters. Uh, the penstock run, which is what you see shown here, is roughly 500 meters. Here's another view of the site. It's an old mine, which is pretty cool in itself. It turns out that mines are a very good location to, for us to build our early projects. Um, some civil engineering drawings of the reservoir. Again, it looks like a fairly conventional hydro or pumped hydro storage project, um, with the exception that we have an enclosed reservoir uh, for the closed loop system. Um, we can also talk a little bit about the turbo machinery. So to work with this project, uh, the demonstration project, we're developing a custom turbine. Um, if, if any of the big water turbine manufacturers looked at this, they'd say it's like, yeah, that's a, that's a Francis turbine, yeah. Mm. But if they took out a tape measure and they started measuring things, they'd be like, hang on, what's, what's going on here? And I think that's a very good example. It's very emblematic of the type of R&D and technology development we are doing. We don't want to be reinventing the wheel here. We are learning from a very established industry. So we're taking the existing knowledge from Francis turbines, but we're adapting it to the specific needs and requirements of our application and particularly our fluid. So just a simple example here, you see some pretty pictures of computational fluid dynamics. And we, we, we optimize the hydraulic design of the turbine to work with much denser fluid that also have a different uh, viscous profile. We also worry about things like abrasion um, and lifetime and so, so on. And, and that, that activity of adapting hydro knowledge to work with HD hydro is prevalent in our R&D works. Perhaps the biggest exception to that, I've already touched on this in the previous slide, is our high density fluid and the design of that fluid, which is a combination of process engineering and chemistry. Um, this is just a snapshot of one of the many test rigs we've got. I think it's right there, you can almost see it. It's a vertical settling column. So we put our fluid into this column and we let it sit for weeks and we see how does it age? Does it settle out? So the two samples we have, one is our prototype fluid and you see significant banding after a long period of time. The next generation fluid around the same period of time doesn't have that same level of banding. So this is the kind of engineering we're doing. And it's a good way to segue sort of into my summary slide of our technology work. This is our R&D, more specifically our technology roadmap. It's actually aged reasonably well, I, I, I think. Um, and one of the things I love about startups and being part of a technology startup, being a CTO, in a, in a startup is you guide the company through these phases, um, which are very distinct. It's very, very different. The company re-energized as it was two years ago is almost unrecognizable compared to what it is today. And that reflects the fact that our technology is moving from what was an early, you know, purely um, uh, experimental and, and conceptual phase through R&D to where we are now. We're roughly in the middle of the slide. We're at TRL 6, 7. We're in the pilot stage. That pilot project in the UK really for us will be a milestone of a, of a TRL 7 um, a product, TRL 7, TRL 8. Um, and the next step after that, which we're already pursuing, is going to be a, a pilot project, which is really going to be the final demonstration, a pilot project pre-commercial, um, and then, and then on, as a route to commercialization. I'm actually going to stop there uh, because of my time limit. Great, thank you so much. Very, very exciting. And, and thanks for the, the videos and the visuals. And I encourage all our uh, participants to check out the website for, for more videos. Um, and, and feel free to chat your questions uh, about uh, re-energize. I, I see one question here, um, as raw materials can be a constraint to scale, does the high density component um, of R19 face any constraints, any supply constraints? 
Well, I'm glad you asked that question. So yes, absolutely. That was like such a big consideration. And yeah, um, we've designed and engineered the solution specifically to address that. So without giving away our top secrets, uh, that supply chain is there. And there's that ability and the availability of, so we've got some fantastic partners in industry um, and we know we have the supply chain to meet you know, the needs of <laughs> several generations. I'm talking human generations here, like decades of supply. So that was a key consideration. It would be pointless to create a high density fluid where, where you only could produce one or two projects a year. That would not solve it. We wanna be producing it's a you know aspirational target. We want something of 500 projects a year is where we need to. So we work towards questions all the time. If if we design the fluid to be this way, can we produce that much of it? Great, excellent talk. Uh, what are some of the height? What are some of the height targets you're looking at? Also, do you have a sense of your R, uh, R, RTE round trip efficiency? Right. So um, in terms of elevation, so the demonstration project we're building in the UK is at 80 two meters of elevation, slightly less than that now. Um, and that makes sense. Uh, 100 meters, 200 meters, uh, you know, is, is really where we're looking at these spots. It's driven very much by the sites. You know, for example, I mentioned mines. Now, mines typically have elevation that's on the order of 100 meters, 150 meters. They don't have 300 meters. So that's kind of a very sweet spot for us to be. And in terms of round trip efficiency, yeah, we're, we're aiming for, we're, you know, we're telling everyone that 80 percent round trip efficiency, which is effectively what conventional pumped hydro achieves. Um, rest assured that the team here is, is pushing for slightly more than that. So we're definitely pushing that to, to where it makes the most economic sense, right? So we want to, it's always an engineering trade-off. Everything here is an engineering trade-off. I can give you 98% efficiency, maybe, but it would cost a lot of money, then it doesn't make sense. So you need to, to you know, make that trade-off and say, it's like, what's the, the sweet spot from an engineering trade-off and economic optimal? Um, and that, so let's use 80% as a round trip efficiency. Great. Any, um, any other questions? Feel free to chat here. Uh, Tomash, I also have a question as you look into going from piloting to commercialization, what do you see are the major challenges? And, and from a permitting perspective, um, have you come across any challenges there? So, okay, I'll, let me address the second one about permitting, which is definitely a big consideration. Um, I know that you know, we know we have lots of conversations with the established pump hydro industry that that's a major consideration. We've had this fantastic experience. The demonstration project in Plymouth has gone through that whole process and we've been successful. So we've successfully completed the permitting process, environmental impact assessment and all of those steps. So we now have that firsthand experience and success of doing that. And a lot of it is coming back to this idea of, well, what can we do about the system and the solution to design it to be as easy to go through the permitting process as possible? To answer your first part of your question is, what do we see as the biggest challenges as we move from, uh, from, from let's call it a demonstration project to a piloting project? It's the usual. It's the same things you get of any technology company, which is maturing the technology from a TRL7 to TRL9. It sounds like, hey, that's two numbers. That's not so bad, but that's the really hard numbers, right? A different type of hard. It's, it's a lot of effort, a lot of hours, and a lot of money. And I think that's the other part is money and the typical startup problem. So if you know, hey, we need to sort of bridge the expectation from where we are today to when we will be commercial and profitable. And we need to convince all the stakeholders, which is euphemism for investors and customers to really journey with us on that, on that uh, you know, few years we have to go through this process of demonstration, pilot, early commercial projects, and then saving the planet part. Great, thank you. Uh, we have two more questions and then we'll, um, then we'll move on to Ushaka's presentation. Uh, is Re-Energize partnering with hydro turbine OEMs to procure the prime mover? Are, uh, are new materials necessary for the HC fluid or would the standard hydro turbine materials prove to be acceptable? So this is a very turbine specific question. Um, I, we didn't really get into it in this presentation, but the only way Re-Energize can achieve these volumes, right? This, this, this trillion dollar opportunity, we're not gonna get there if we wanna vertically integrate and do everything ourselves. I'm not gonna be manufacturing, we're actually moving out of the space, we're moving into a much bigger space, but even that bigger space isn't gonna allow me to manufacture, you know, many hunt like a thousand turbines a year, which is what we're sort of aiming for. Um, so, and that's the same for valves and power electronics and, and the whole uh, chain. And this goes back to that point that we wanna leverage that existing 
hydropower industry knowledge. So ultimately, we want to be in a position where we can work with the established OEMs to manufacture an uh, HD hydro branded or compliant turbine solution that customers can then use. Um, as for the other differences that go in there, yes, absolutely. So material selection is definitely part of it. There's a lot of, uh, you know, the, that saying about devil is in the details. Remember I said, I like simple ideas. That's because even simple ideas become very complicated when you get through into the level of execution. So the, the details of designing HD turbine adapted specific for high density hydro, there's a lot of very, very specific things you need to solve. So, um, yeah. Okay, and last question, are you planning uh, fixed or variable speed pump turbines? So that's a great question too. So, so we are absolutely working on variable speed turbines. You can probably see one of our drives right there, maybe on the walls. Uh, we use variable frequency drives, we use permanent magnet uh, generators, um, but it's a good industry question. I know, for example, in North America, nobody uses, as far as I know, there's no project in North America that uses variable speed drives for pumped hydro. That's a market thing. The market hasn't really rewarded anybody to go through that trouble. We're first of all designing for a global application, but we're also anticipating that the market's moving and that those uh, revenue streams that rely on variable speed are going to be uh, dominant in the future. And so it's worth designing that up front. It's also sort of the new technology, which allows us to have good efficiencies. And it allows us to do a bunch of clever things too, um, which I don't have time to get into now, but there's more that you can do if you've got variable speed drives. So yes, we're, we're very much variable frequency, variable speed um, generation. Great. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Thanks for the great questions. And we'll now hear from Ushaka from uh, Riot Development. Thank you, Tomas, and thank you, Sumin, as I am. Just give me one second, and I'm trying to set up presentation here. Can you guys see my screen? I can't see your slide deck yet. Okay. Uh, Nothing. Uh, now? now, yeah, we can see it. Great. Okay. And am I audible clear? So yep, yep, clear. Okay, great. So um, good afternoon, good morning, um, depending on where, where you are. Um, um, my name is Ushakar Jai and I'm uh, VP of Project Engineering at uh, RAI Development. Uh, my background is uh, I'm a professional civil engineer with masters in uh, hydraulics and uh, flood control uh, and also an uh, MBA. Uh, I have 20 years of hydropower and pump storage um, design, development, um, construction supervision experience working in the United States as well as uh, internationally. And um, so a little bit about dry. Um, uh, for those of who um, you don't know, um, um, we started as, as free flow power and I um, around 2009-10 um, timeframe um, with a mission to install um, slow moving hydrokinetic technology um, uh, in the Mississippi River. Um, and, um, but uh, however, we worked on that technology for I would say a couple of years and then um, there was no market at that point of time, and we had to sell that, um, that technology and development um, uh, then. Uh, but in that process, uh, RAI um, or free flow power at that time, we learned immensely about federal, state, and local permitting and uh, regulatory uh, processes, um, and uh, obviously a natural transition 
uh, was to hydropower and pump storage um, technologies. Um, so I would say around 2011 um, timeframe, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, around 2011 um, time, time frame, we transitioned into hydro, um, uh, mainly into, into um, uh, conventional hydro projects. And um, in 2014, um, free flow power morphed into ride development. Um, and um, today we command a portfolio of, um, I would say almost five gigawatt of projects, including uh, pump storage and, um, uh, and conventional hydro. These are all new projects under development at, um, at, at this point of time. Um, uh, and um, we are funded by um, C CAI, a leading investor um, um, of infrastructure projects across uh, the, the globe. And uh, this is our uh, project map. Um, this slide essentially shows uh, uh, locations uh, of our projects. As you can tell, uh, most locations are, I would say, opportunity-based. Um, we, we have a rigorous uh, site selection process, uh, which includes mainly looking at um, landowner situation, um, transmission interconnection potential, and most important off-take opportunities. Um, um, and and uh, so far, um, most of our pump storage projects are out, uh, are, are in, in out west. Um, and um, 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 southwest and, and southeast. Um, and so we, um, some of those are in, in exploration stage at this time, so you might not see on, on this um, uh, project map. Um, and, um, and the conventional hydro projects are located all east of um, Mississippi um, you know, with a heavy concentration around Pittsburgh area. Um, now, um, as I mentioned, um, about five gigawatt of planned uh, platform that, that RAI has at this time, um, um, the, the two projects that you see, um, uh, Swan Lake and Goldendale, these are the two pump storage projects um, which are uh, much advanced compared to the rest of the portfolio. Um, and uh, 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 Swan Lake is located in, in Klamath County um, and it's um, licensed as 393.3 megawatt, uh, um, was licensed as uh, three units. Um, at this time, we are exploring a two unit solution for, for um, Swan Lake. Um, as I mentioned, it's the most advanced one. Um, it's currently in the pre-construction phase. Um, Goldendale is another uh, one behind Swan Lake, which is expected to receive fork license I would say in um, Q3 this year. Um, the other projects in the pipeline are Lewis Ridge, um, um, a, a 20 mile elephant rock, uh, soldier camp. These are some of the names and then there are a few um, others which are not here yet because we are still exploring. We haven't um, uh, the, um, submitted any um, yeah, those of you who, who know uh, FERC process of permitting and licensing, we haven't submitted a permit yet to, to fork license, and that's why I have not included uh, in this list. Um, but we, we do have other projects as well that we are exploring um, yeah, at, at several other, other sites. Um, uh, just uh, again, pointing out um, um, Lewis Ridge is one which is um, located at a former coal mine site. And 20 mile is an, um, on a, uh, I call this as an innovative approach um, of utilizing um, underground uh, mine uh, uh, pool um, or, or water available uh, uh, as, as a lower reservoir. Um, so um, that's, that's another concept. So, um, what you see here is, um, again, I think um, uh, Tomas touched a little bit on the, the uh, concept of pump storage, and I didn't know that. Uh, so I may repeat uh, uh, again um, what uh, he had. 
Um, so um, I, I call this as you know a, a, a classical example of uh, gravity and Newtonian physics. Uh, a, a typical conventional pump storage project um, consists of uh, two interconnected reservoirs, as you can see, uh, upper reservoir and lower reservoir, um, and um, and and lower reservoir could be lakes, rivers, uh, even um, upper reservoir could be lakes, rivers, and, and we will talk about different types and systems of, of pump storage. Um, and then there are tunnels that convey water from one reservoir to another, um, also called waterways. Um, and then there are turbine shutoff valves, hydro machinery, uh, and those could be pump turbine, motor generator transformers, um, a transmission switch, a switch yard, or um, 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 uh, also called substation and a transmission connection. Um, so that's that's kind of uh, components of uh, a, a pump storage uh, project. Um, now, um, how the system works um, is as uh, some of the things uh, as as you see here is. Um, Essentially, during periods of low electricity um, demand, um, electricity demand, excess wind and solar energy can be stored by pumping water uphill. Um, and um, during peak demand or when wind solar production drops, uh, water is released uh, from upper reservoir uh, to generate electricity. So in a very simplistic way, that's the operational mechanism of a pump storage facility. Um, now, um, I included a little bit of history here um, because as Tamas said, um, this is a proven technology. Um, so um, it's, it's fascinating that um, how old the technology is. Um, so 1891 is, um, uh, is the first known hydromechanical storage um, plant uh, in, in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. And, um, and in, in, interestingly, um, at that time, it was not exactly called a pump storage. It was just a storage plant. And then in 1904, I think, um, Officially, it got a name called um, uh, as, as a pump storage uh, plant. And then um, um, almost like um, 25 years later um, in, in um, United States, um, we, we had Rocky River pump storage uh, plant in, in um, Connecticut on the uh, Hosatonic River. Um, so that's a little bit uh, history here. Um, the pump storage turbines are of um, uh, three types. Again, um, um, Francis, Pelton, and Kaplan. Um, um, pretty much these are the names um, uh, or, or types of turbine names, uh, whether in conventional or in pump storage. Uh, again, um, I just included some of the um, uh, uh, invention uh, timelines so that you can understand um, how mature and proven this technology is. Uh, Francis, 1848, Pelton, 1870, and Kaplan, 1913. Um, so um, we can definitely say um, this technology is century old for sure um, with, with the, all these um, turbine inventions that was done. Um, so um, next one uh, uh, is on the uh, some of the design parameters, like if, if you are thinking of installing a pump storage uh, or, or designing a pump storage plant, then what are some of the things that you should be thinking about? Um, the, 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 the important thing I think um, Tamas also touched upon, which is head and elevation, um, uh, whether you call that as, as gross head that we generally call or uh, elevation, some, some uh, call also this as gradient, um, grade, all those uh, things. Um, but the, the difference in, in water surface elevation uh, between uh, upper and lower reservoirs, um, that defines the, the grade or, or gross head uh, or elevation. Um, and, and the difference between maximum and minimum depth 
in a reservoir. Um, that, that gives us the, the, the depth of storage um, that, that is possible in a reservoir. Um, and then you multiply that depth by the surface area of the reservoir and you get a storage volume. Um, so that's how we get a storage volume. Um, and, um, and the product of the total volume of water uh, and the, the differential height between the reservoirs is proportional to the amount of stored electricity. Um, so, um, you know, the, 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 the more, more, more the height and, and the storage, uh, the more electricity you, you, can, you can store. Uh, store. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll, we'll talk again later um, that kind of gives um, the, in, in terms of capacity when we are talking, whether it's, uh, whether we are talking in uh, megawatts, like few megawatts, 100 megawatts or 1000 megawatts, these, these parameters become pretty important at that point. Um, now, um, generally speaking, the components are very efficient uh, in terms of changing one form of energy into another. Um, as you can see, the efficiencies are ranges from 99% um, to 92%. Uh, this is not the round trip efficiency, just um, uh, making sure that this is just each pump, motor, um, um, and, and not even turbines. Um, and transform those efficiencies. For turbine, as you can see, there is a chart and the turbine efficiency varies uh, depending on, so, the, the, so it has an operating range and within that operating range, efficiency varies. Um, now, um, uh, adjustable, uh, so what you see here is, uh, um, I uh, put in two types of turbines, uh, adjustable speed and fixed speed turbines. Uh, adjustable speed machine is slightly improved um, than fixed speed machine. Um, and as you can see here, I would consider almost 10 to 15% more efficient. And um, modern pump storage pl uh, plants are more commonly um, nowadays cited with a, a reversible Francis turbine um, with wicket gates, the speed governor, um, and, and, um, and, and other um, yeah, you know, power electronics. Um, now, selection of a pump turbine um, depends on various factors. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about um, uh, and, and like uh, the, those uh, operating head, um, as, as I mentioned uh, about the gross head um, and um, setting in relation to upper and lower reservoir levels um, the specific speed, synchronous speed, uh, water column, time constant, um, draft tube surging. Um, these are all um, the, the things that you have to consider when you are uh, siting or designing a pump storage uh, uh, facility. Um, and um, so next we will talk about different types of, of turbines. So um, there are a uh, few different types of, um, I would say pump storage systems, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, and uh, pump back pump storage system, I would say is uh, primitive uh, among all these systems and um, um, which um, relies on the use of two reservoirs uh, located in tandem, which means on a, on a river system, uh, if you have two dams, uh, then um, the, uh, like at, at, the, uh, at the beginning of, of this storage, uh, pump storage uh, uh, concept that was um, understood as one possible way of designing pump storage system, uh, which was, um, you know, if you have two dams, uh, how can we use those two pools and, and get some storage? Um, and, and so uh, th that's, that, that is what is called pump back, uh, pump storage facility. Uh, and then came open loop uh, system. And open loop system is um, one um, where the, the um, uh, upper reservoir is constructed by excavating uh, material um, uh, and, and, and closing dike um, to form the reservoir. And the lower reservoir is either an uh, existing body 
uh, of water or, or a stream. Um, and um, that's, that's more, I would say, uh, commonly seen pump storage. If you look up uh, pump storage projects, that's the design concept that you will see uh, more prevalent. Um, uh, that was built in 80s or, or um, 90s or, or before, uh, even before that. Um, and examples would be uh, Rocky Mountain um, or um, Raccoon Mountain is, is, is a great example in Tennessee. Um, and then um, Lake, um, um, there is a pump storage project uh, on, uh, called uh, Ludington, um, uh, where the lower reservoir is actually uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, it's also a very famous project um, with, with a very um, um, less con uh, head, um, uh, lesser than uh, relatively speaking, that, that pump storage projects uh, typically um, uh, will have um, head in, in thousands of, of uh, feet, uh, but Ludington is, is uh, designed with only 300 uh, uh, feet um, um, of, of gross head. Um, so that's that's another. Uh, the 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 third type is is closed loop pump storage, and and closed loop pump storage um, is um, more low impact um, from environmental perspective, where both reservoirs are off stream. Um, um, and um, example is what Rye is developing um, 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 currently, uh, Swan Lake project is a perfect um, uh, example of uh, um, uh, closed loop system um, where um, uh, 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 generally you use uh, groundwater or um, surface um, uh, flow um, to fill the reservoir. Um, or in some cases, um, uh, we might use um, the, the, uh, the river flow uh, for one time filling of the lower reservoir. Um, and um, that is what we are using for Goldendale and, um, and Lewis Ridge as well. Um, so Swan Lake, Goldendale and Lewis Ridge, these are all closed loop pump storage projects. And that's what um, Rye mainly focuses on, on closed loop pump storage projects. Um, and then um, I do have here um, different types of, uh, again, different types of turbine in terms of fixed and variable. Um, and, and even within fixed speed turbines, uh, or, or um, when I say turbines, it's the, the electromechanical system. Um, there is um, uh, reversible, uh, and then there is ternary type of fixed speed, and there is variable speed, which also comes as doubly fed or fully fed. Um, um, those, um, I, I would say that the, the um, actual design and physics of electromechanical components are, are much more complex and much effort has been put into research and design to improve the efficiency. Um, and, and so um, suppliers like Andres, Voigt, and GE, they have put a lot in effort in, in optimizing the power electronics. And in, in today, um, I think power electronics is, is what is driving um, a lot of uh, innovation in, in the pump storage electro um, mechanical machinery system. The next oh, Shaka, one. I know you have a couple more slides, but um, if you can wrap up in three minutes, we can, we can budget a little time for Q&A. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll skip on the technology side, maybe on, on uh, if you have questions, I'll, I'll take. Um, I just, uh, um, uh, the, this chart I just uh, lifted off uh, from the um, um, uh, DOE uh, long duration energy storage liftoff uh, report that came out, I think, uh, earlier this month. And as um, you know, no surprise, again, pump storage has been identified as a critical bulk long um, uh, and uh, long and short duration uh, resource. Um, so found this very interesting. Um, uh, I'll happy to share the link to that report. Uh, the next one, again, from, from the same um, uh, report. Um, and here again, I think you can see the levelized cost of uh, storage. Um, uh, again, pump storage rank pretty high on, on that as well. And the bottom chart is, is compelling um, and compelling in terms of 
um, supply chain. As you can see, that in terms of how low to no um, apparent supply chain risks are with pump storage technology. Um, so that is also uh, very, very interesting. Um, the next one we touched upon um, because of all the innovation and improvements done in the um, electromechanical uh, uh, portion of, of the pump storage technology. Now, um, pump storage as well as hydropower, they can um, contribute so much to the grid reliability. And, and I'll not go through all this list, but as you can see, and, and, they, and the, the, the important thing is a lot of things that pump storage and hydro can do, which wind and solar cannot. Um, so the next one, again, um, I don't have to mention why pump storage. I think it's quite obvious, uh, but these are the list of projects that are operating within the United States in terms of pump storage. And um, why pump storage? Again, um, very, very obvious with, with all these reasons. Um, the next one, this is very interesting. I found this, I think, I, I either from Twitter or LinkedIn, someone posted this, but this is um, interesting, there had been so much talk about um, the, the duck curve and uh, look what has happened now to the duck curve in, in 2023. There are times when, when there is um, zero to negative net, uh, net uh, load on, on the system. Um, so this is again, very, very interesting. This is from April 26. Um, so with uh, that, thank you and uh, back to you, uh, Sumit. Yeah, great. Thank you, Shaka. Great, great information. And and I will we'll share the slides with everybody. I know there was a lot of great information contained here. So um we'll, we'll be sharing the slides afterwards. Any questions from the, the audience? Shaka, I have one question. In terms of um looking at the timeline, how long does it take to to kind of design a, a, a project and bring it on online? So um, typically I would say like around um, seven, um, yeah, seven years uh, is, is what, what we see, seven to eight years. I mean, uh, earlier it used to take longer, but now that the, the licensing and permitting part of this is getting more and more, um, um, I, I would say, um, you know, uh, streamlined um, by FERC, and and that used to be a big uh, uh, time taking process. Um, now the idea is that within two to three years you can get your uh, permitting part done, and then there is another pre construction part that you have to uh, budget for maybe one or two years um, in in order to get offtake uh, and and other things in place. And then construction could range between three to five years. And, and there's been a lot of, um, this isn't necessarily a technology question, but there's been a lot of um, a, a, a funding coming from with the IRA in the US. Uh, do you see any funding uh, that, that is available for, for companies like yours, projects like your, yours? Do you see an, um, an uh, increased funding or interest? Yes, and, um, and and that is, um, I, I would say this is the time for 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 pump storage and and hydropower technology as such because of all the things that's included in the IRA um, and and various other reasons. But definitely, um, one is the the um, ITC, the tax credit, um, that that thirty percent tax credit, which now pump storage can also avail. Um, is um, is a game changer. Uh, yeah. Great. Great. Well, well, thank you so much to both our speakers, Tamasha and Oshaka. Great, uh, great information. Uh, really great to see the exciting work that both your companies are doing. And thank you for all our attendees for joining today. We'll be following up with the recording and the slides. Um, and we do, the LDS Technology um, puts together these technology sh sharing sessions every month. So stay tuned for the next one, which will be towards the end of June. Well, thank you, everybody, and have a good day. Great, thanks. Bye. Thank you, everyone.